Turnip Boy Commits Tax Evasion had one of the best titles in video game history. While its sequel, Turnip Boy Robs a Bank, doesn't have a title that's nearly as surprising, it managed to shock us by completely changing up its playstyle. It might be a different game in a lot of ways, but some much-needed quality-of-life improvements and cleaned-up combat make its more fast-paced action and new roguelite structure a clear improvement over the original. Most importantly, this is still a Turnip Boy game. It has the same absurdist sense of humor, meme-heavy internet culture references, and random side quests that you come to expect. Turnip Boy's world is just different. There's been an apocalyptic war, and he's learned about his family's mafia history, and most of all, he's packing some new weapons. Turnip Boy Robs a Bank begins not long after the events of the first game. Two days, in fact. After Turnip Boy ripped up a bunch of documents, stood up to Mayor Onion and embraced his mafia heritage and commits tax evasion, he had to fight a secret final boss, the God Onion. This ended in a war so devastating that it felt like the world was about to end, and that's how Robs a Bank starts. The big mechanical difference between the two Turnip Boy games is that the first was a dungeon crawler with light combat and puzzle solving, while the second is a roguelite that's essentially all combat. One of the first items Turnip Boy is handed is a gun, and not long after that, you get into a truck, ram into a bank, and start killing. Your goal is to collect as much money as possible as you seek the larger cash hidden inside the bank. Unfortunately, there's a time limit, and the bank will be overrun by cops that'll make it more difficult to escape. If you decide to fight your way through and take your time, the bank owner, Stinky, will unleash gas that will eventually kill you. That puts a good level of pressure on you to gather as many resources as you can and get out fast. You eventually make it back to your headquarters, where you can recycle weapons, buy performance enhancers – their words, not mine – and go on the dark web before heading back to cause more havoc. There was concern about how Turnip Boy Robs a Bank would translate into a combat-centric roguelite, especially when action was one of the weaker parts of the first one. That wasn't as big of a deal then because the focus was on puzzles. The bones from the first game, which include forcing Turnip Boy to trip to dodge, are still here, but the weapon accuracy is much better. It still feels a bit floaty, and sometimes it felt like we were spamming the trip key to align Turnip Boy correctly with enemies, but it's a huge improvement. Plus, there are two difficulty settings and some accessibility toggles that can help you get through tough spots. There are also a ton of weapons you can try to find your favorite playstyle, so maybe accuracy won't matter as much. You'll unlock the basic guns you've seen in most games, like a pistol, assault rifle, or grenade launcher. But as you fight through the bank and unlock more areas, enemies will drop a seemingly endless array of weapons. Some just cause elemental damage, but you can also find a weapon that unleashes firecrackers, a flower-shaped weed whacker that tears through enemies like a chainsaw, and the largest sword you've ever seen, just to name a few. You can play out your runs ahead of time to an extent since the four areas never change, but this is a roguelite, so there has to be some randomness. Here, the bank elevator will open up on a random floor during each run. This is due to a bank safety protocol, obviously, and the guy who runs the elevator isn't happy about it either. You could want to finish a side quest, but not get let out on the floor you need to complete it for a long time. Rob's a Bank is a vastly different experience than Commits Tax Evasion, but that isn't to say the new Turnip Boy is completely unrecognizable. Sure, it's almost entirely Switch genres, but Turnip Boy is still the same silent hero with a permanent grin. He's still bombarded with constant nonsense from the world and people around him, and he still hilariously won't react to any of it. You'll be minding your own business trying to clear a room, only to see the most inane internet pop culture reference – there are quite a few Bitcoin jokes here, for instance – and that sense of humor works just as well here as it did the first time around. Best of all, you'll still be tasked with fulfilling long-winded optional errands for NPCs – things like finding rings to help two berries get engaged, or shaking down a bean for a graphics card. There are some new ones this time, including collecting the souls of your enemies for a DJ that unlocks new music. Completing these only gets you an achievement and maybe a hat, but they're worth working for. They're cute and mostly predictable. If you help a guy out with a rat-related quest, you'll get a hat that makes you look like a rat. But a couple of them are scene stealers. There's one that lets you walk around like a Doug Dimmodome meme, and I kept it on for most of the time I had it, only changing it into a fedora so I could wield a revolver like a true crime boss. These extended side missions were in the first game too, but it was tough to keep track of them since there wasn't a quest log. Thankfully, you now have a task list in your menu to do just that, excitingly addressing one of Commit's tax evasion's biggest letdowns. It's still not a perfect system, since there's no way to record where quest givers are located, and it's easy to forget where they are, since it can sometimes take hours to get the item they've asked for, but it's a welcome addition nonetheless. 
Rob's a bank is very overt about its politics, and you'll come away knowing exactly how the developers see the world, from how they feel about NFTs to the big Unity controversy from last year. You'll also get way more lore about the Turnip Boy universe, with more details on how its world came to be and how we as humans destroyed it. That candor makes the jokes feel more personal, but it's also just fun. It always manages to surprise you, even when a section could become frustrating or repetitive, you're pushed along just to see what it'll do next. Along with clearing out the bank to discover the mother load at its center, there are four bosses you'll have to defeat before you can confront the final one. Commit's tax evasion had a big issue with its bosses, which were exponentially tougher than its normal enemies and created unexpected and frustrating difficulty spikes. Oddly, Rob's a bank has the opposite problem in that the first boss is the most difficult and the last of the initial four is the easiest. We could chalk this up to taking our time to get comfortable with the combat while finding a winning strategy, but it does also feel like a bit of a pacing issue, especially when you get to the final confrontation. That last fight is a slog, forcing you to go back over things you've already done and rushing you to a big reveal you then have no time to sit with. This is just one symptom of the larger pacing problems with the Turnip Boy series, which is strange considering that both games are only a few hours long. Rob's a Bank at least has a greater sense of discovery, so you're always finding secrets, having conversations, and completing silly quests for stupid hats. It's been expanded, so the joy lasts longer as a result, but a lot of the charm runs out by the end, which is a shame when it only took us about three or four hours to unlock every upgrade. Turnip Boy Rob's a Bank does what it says in the title, but like in its predecessor, it's about so much more than just stealing money. It's a completely different game in many ways, from its new, action-packed combat mechanics to some much-needed quality-of-life features, but this is still the same Turnip Boy you know. There are still ridiculous references and cartoonish hats, and Turnip Boy still walks around smiling like nothing is wrong. It still holds on to what made Commit's tax evasion so memorable, even if its hero has killed way more people since the last time we saw him. Guess you could say that's growth. For more game reviews, check out what we thought of Prince of Persia The Lost Crown, and for everything gaming, you're already in the right place, IGN.